Asylum is obviously a form of relief that's um, protection based. It's um, may asylum may lead to permanent residence and citizenship, but at bottom, it's a form of protecting people to return um, from return to a country of feared persecution. And so, when you think about analyzing asylum claims, whether to pursue it or not, whether it's the right form of relief. There are questions of statutory eligibility, but also the question to ask yourself, you know, is whether it fits, does it, this make sense? I find that asylum is one of the most creative forms of relief available. There are a lot, lot of factual circumstances that one way or another you can fit um, into that protection framework. And I think especially for children, there are a lot of creative ways to define a claim that way. But it's not every single claim. And so, uh, like anything else, I encourage everybody to um, think like a lawyer about whether you can satisfy the elements, but don't be afraid uh, under the ethical standards. You know, a good faith argument for an expansion of the law is uh, non-frivolous and ethically permissible. And I think um, sometimes this can be the most flexible remedy for kids who really need protection. Um, so. Um, Nothing about the law of eligibility for asylum for kids is different except um, the topic of a one-year deadline that I'm going to talk about, but the factual scenarios that give rise to asylum for kids I think is somewhat different, but when I go through these slides about um, at what asylum is, what the elements are, and what you need to prove, realize that that's almost exactly the same as for adults. First of all, I want to distinguish um, asylum from refugee, and uh, you've heard a lot of um, characterization of the children crossing the border recently as being refugees. Um, there is a distinction legally, which is that to be um, characterized as a refugee, someone has to be adjudicated a refugee while they're abroad. Um, for asylum, they are adjudicated in the United States after they've somehow physically, <coughs> excuse me, crossed the border. But the definition of who's eligible for asylum is somebody who satisfies the statutory definition of a refugee. So the, the only distinction in the legal test that distinguishes one from another is the place where they're physically located at the time that they make their application and are adjudicated. So um, then, so what is the definition of a refugee to then to inform us as to who's eligible for asylum? You have to show, first of all, that you have a well-founded, what's called well-founded fear of persecution. Um, and what is a well-founded fear? Well-founded fear has to have um, an objective component and a subjective component. The, ob the subjective part is the person has to have um, a truly felt, genuine fear of return. The objective component is um, people standing similarly situated, people in the shoes of that applicant would also reasonably fear return to the home country under those same circumstances. So the, um, the best example I can give of what doesn't is what doesn't qualify. When people have a subjective fear, but when they explain it, it's, you know, the Martians kidnapped me and put things in my teeth to send signals, or I have a football in my stomach and God sends a signal that makes the football expand and it's going to explode. Okay, the, those are examples of genuine subjective fear, but not objectively reasonable. So in a more traditional case, you have to show through the testimony that the client has a fear and they have to express a fear. You can't make up a fear. They have to be able to say they're not willing to return for some reason. If they say I'm fine and nothing would happen to me, that is going to be pretty um, dooming of an asylum claim regardless of how much corroboration you have about how things are da you know really dangerous for them so um, you need the objective component but the subjective reasonability is where the adjudications mostly turn um, and you prove that and we'll talk a bit more about it by country conditions information and other types of corroborative evidence so um, a well-founded fear of persecution can be established in two ways 
One is by proving past persecution. That is some form of serious harm in the home country um, that uh, makes the person unable or unwilling to return. Um, in adults, that's frequently arrest, detention, um, uh, you know, false prosecution, something like that. It can be, you know, you had your house firebombed or a, a variety of other more severe things. All of those same things, if they've happened to children, can also give you past persecution, but there's very good guidance, and I'll talk a bit more about the sources. There's good guidance that things that may not rise to the level of persecution for adults for children may amount to persecution because of just, it's sort of the reverse of what we talked about before about how children perceive time children perceive harm children perceive threats children perceive dangerousness in different ways so even a risk um, a small risk that somebody might do something to a parent or to the child themselves um, may or a small um, let's say a small kind of bad act, a small something happening in school, or a small incident in the community, small from the eyes of an adult, may be um, in fact persecutory to a child. Um, now the most important thing in analyzing an asylum claim, I think in terms of the legal elements, is that the persecution that the applicant fears has to be on account of one of the five statutory grounds. And I realized that I listed out a bunch of examples for the grounds, but I didn't actually spell out the grounds here. The five statutory grounds are race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. Um, so race is pretty straightforward. Um, Religion is pretty straightforward, although uh, let's say um, atheism in particular and sometimes apostasy or agnosticism, depending on the community, um, can qualify as a religious-based claim. Um, nationality can be linked to ethnicity. So there's some decent case law there, so some of the indigenous claims may fit under a nationality claim as well as under a particular social group claim. Um, political opinion. The most important thing I can say there is that can also be imputed political opinion. So if you're the child of a party organizer or the mayor or uh, the head of a um, um, what do you call it? opposition party, <laughs> sorry. Um, if your if your dad or mom is you know the head of a union or the head of a um, an opposition party or something like that or for that matter it doesn't only have to be your parents your big brother your grandfather whatever um, and this person whoever your relative is is um, extremely unliked mistrusted or whatever by the government authorities just by virtue of your relationship to that person um, it may be believed um, by the controlling authorities that you're likely to be just like that. So imputed political opinion um, can be a basis for asylum and it's often one that comes up for children. Um, this same thing uh, uh, about imputed political opinion can happen if you belong to a particular ethnic group or a particular religion um, where it's genu generally believed that persons who are a member of a certain group also share some political beliefs in common. So just the fact that you're from the south of a country or from the coastal area or from uh, the, let's say, I th I'm thinking, you know, in Nigeria about the north, a Muslim area. There may be a belief, even if you don't profess some of those beliefs, that a certain political opinion can be attributed to you just because of um, some other characteristic that you have. Um, there has to be uh, the, the statutory ground, whatever is the ground on which the claim is based, doesn't have to be the exclusive reason for the persecution, but it has to be one central reason for the persecution that the person fears. Mixed motives are okay, but the one that falls within um, at least one of those statutory grounds uh, has to be uh, one central one, and that's a fairly recent change in the law. Also, the harm, the persecution that the person fears has to be at the hands of the government 
or an actor that the government cannot or will not control. So um, gangs in some of the countries that we're talking about for the kids' claims um, fall into that category of entities that the government cannot or will not control. There are places where the, um, the allegations are that the police are actually um, collaborating with, in cahoots with the gangs or the narco traffickers, so a child or any other asylum applicant can't seek government protection because the, the government is aligned with the persecutor. Um, but in other places, it, they may want to control the persecutor, but are just too weak to do so. Um, so either one of those cannot or will not control the persecutor um, can be the um, qualify the requirement for state failure to protect. And of course, if it's the government that's going to act directly against the applicant, then the state action is clear. Okay, so here is um, where I've given you some examples of where um, these claims often come up for children. And again, I wanna echo the point that Laura made earlier in the questioning. Just like you can't ask a child, have you been abused, abandoned, or neglected? You also can't say, do you have a well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of the five grounds, okay? You have to frame your questions on intake to get at, you know, has anything bad ever happened to you in your country? Or when did you first start having problems? Or when did you make the decision to leave and why? What immediately preceded that? What kind of problems did you have? Did other members of your family have any problems? And you try to drill down to one of one or more because you don't you don't have to zero only on one of the five because often they overlap, but you have to have at least one of the five. You are the one that has to come to the point to check the box to identify the basis for the claim. The client will have to articulate in the story facts that match up with that. But you know, th you literally can't like give the application to the child and expect them to fill the boxes. You have to elicit the story and then match it up somehow. Um, so race, sometimes race outright can be the basis. Indigenous status, when we're talking about children from Central America, is a frequent one. Um, religion, at times, that can be a member of a minority religion or um, there are some strong cases about rejection of the parent or dominant culture religion. And I'm gonna play that out for you. You have some, um, even this is just an example, but evangelical Christian family in an evangelical Christian community, closely controlled, pretty isolated. The child says, I don't believe that, I'm not gonna dress that way, I'm not gonna behave that way, I actually don't, you know, I don't think that's right, I'm not gonna go to church or I'm not gonna wear that kind of clothes or whatever. So it's not that the child has espoused some other religion or that there's persecution of whatever other beliefs the child wants, but the failure to conform, if that gives rise to persecution from the parents the elders in the community, the church leaders, um, whether it's physical abuse, other kind of ostracization, kicking out of the home, um, refusal to access to school, all of these things can happen just by virtue of refusing to conform to the dominant family or community religion. So that's the way religion can come up. Political opinion we talked about can be, and in older teens, often is actual party membership, organizing, um, handing out flyers, leafletting, something like that. Um, but it can also be um, uh, neutrality or avoidance of um, voting, registering to vote, party membership that uh, also can fall into the political opinion category. Now, this is the one where I'm talking about creativity. P particular social group is the area of the law where really the action is. It's where it's the law is evolving the most quickly. Um, it's where there are differences from circuit to circuit in on many of these areas about um, what kind of claims qualify under social group. Um, and some of them are where social trends are actually changing. So cases are coming up more and more because the world is changing. Uh, so some of these that fall into the particular social group category I've listed here, LGBT and transgender claims, and these actually are 
um, quite prevalent coming out of Latin America because no matter what the laws are and how they've been progressing in some of the countries, in practice, the police and government authorities are usually not as receptive as the law may be um, to uh, belonging to some of these groups. Domestic violence, and this can be um, domestic violence directed at the child, him or herself, or also the child witnessing violence to a parent or another family member. This is a place, um, a good example of the one where I said um, something can be persecution that doesn't seem like persecution uh, if it were an adult, and especially think about a child having to watch the mother be abused in one form or another. That nobody may have laid a hand on the child, nobody may have said anything um, inappropriate directly to the child himself, but um, living in that environment where the, they're constantly, you, you, they sort of feel like it's their obligation to protect the mother or be vigilant at every second because something bad might happen to mom, that cumulatively over a period of time may be enough. And this is where I wanted to mention, I always have to look up the letters. Um, there's a new case, the decision date is August 26th of this year, a BIA case called Matter of ARCG. This is a um, really watershed case in the domestic violence area that said that um, it identified as a particular social group, Guatemalan women unable to, um, unable to leave a domestic relationship. So that doesn't pertain to kids directly, but it's the first recognition really strongly from the BIA about domestic violence claims on behalf of women um, uh, opens the door to these kind of domestic violence claims. So I point it out to you because for children, obviously children have less freedom to leave their home than women do. So if you read the analysis about where women can be eligible for asylum because of being unable to leave a violent situation, I think it's a fairly natural leap and an easier one than they had in that case to say um, children living in an ongoing day-to-day -day violent situation are not able to protect themselves or to get out of it. And of course the state actor part is um, when you can establish that the government doesn't do anything to protect children who are in, living in that situation and you know who's an eight-year-old gonna call anyway. Um, so here are some more examples. Street child, child without adult supervision, which are two different things. Um, Gang-related cases and that is escaping from gangs as well as avoiding gang recruitment or conscription. Being claimed as a quote girlfriend of gang members, that is um, uh, and sometimes that's willing at first and sometimes it's not, but um, where a young lady gets um, claimed or chosen by some gang leader and is then unable to get out of that relationship without fear of violence, and then um, fear of harm at the hands of rival gangs. And this is particularly strong um, when there is a, a dominant gang that really is aligned with the government and the, they won't do anything to protect someone fighting back against that gang, or if you can make an analogy to the clans in Somalia when there was no strong central government and all the clans are warring with one another and there are some places where the gang situation is like that and nobody's in charge but the government is not effectively protecting anybody. So um, you may see some of those. So um, that, those are some examples of the kind of factual situations that should get you thinking if you see this kind of case about um, the viability of asylum. We've already gone over the definition of unaccompanied minor. Um, the most important thing that I want to say here, um, and this is the distinction uh, from eligibility as a, uh, contrasted with adult claims, is adults are expected to apply for asylum within one year of arriving in the United States or else they have to come within an exception. Minority is automatically an exception to the one-year deadline, so um, children are not expected to apply within a year of their arrival. The one important thing to know, though, is if they achieve majority, if they turn 18 at some point during your representation, they don't get a year starting then. They have to apply within a reasonable time after turning 18. So there is a deadline of sorts that you have to be aware of if you have an older child. Um, 
we've talked before about the jurisdiction initially being before the asylum office and then the opportunity to renew the claim de novo before the immigration court if the asylum office doesn't approve the claim. Now, I have a couple of slides here about withholding of removal and relief under the torture convention, and those of you who have practiced in immigration law may be familiar with these concepts. They are related but lesser forms of protection. I mentioned earlier that asylum uh, allows a person after one year to apply for adjustment of status, that is to seek to become a permanent resident, and then after that for citizenship in the United States. The I'm calling lesser forms of relief, withholding of removal or relief under the torture convention, don't allow for that um, progression to permanent residence or citizenship, but where there is a bar to asylum, they may be the only forms of protection available to the person. I'm not dwelling on them here because the asylum office doesn't have jurisdiction over withholding of removal or convention against torture. The asylum office can only um, grant asylum. So if your case is one where your child client has one of the bars to asylum, I want you to be aware that if you're not granted and uh, you end up back in immigration court, then you may need to consider withholding of removal or CAT, and I've put material here about it, but I'm not gonna spend time on it because that's not what most of the children's claims um, consist of. The most important thing about Convention Against Torture Relief is you don't have to have one of the five grounds. If you show you would be tortured in the home country for any reason, um, then you're eligible for CAT relief regardless of the bars. Okay, one year deadline, we talked about that. Frivolous asylum application. Well, I'm assuming if any of you are representing the children, they aren't gonna be making a frivolous claim, um, but the judge does give warnings about frivolous asylum applications and an, a claim that's found to be frivolous in any material respect can be a bar um, to future relief under the Immigration Act, so don't do that. Um, not to mention the bad things that can happen to you for bringing forward a frivolous claim. Uh, so we've gone through all the statutory eligibility, um, the statutory elements for asylum. You, uh, the applicant also has to show that they warrant uh, the favorable exercise of discretion. Asylum is a discretionary form of relief. That discretionary component requires a balancing of positive and negative elements. Most of the children who have just crossed the border, um, typically the most negative factor they have is an illegal entry. Right? Some of them may have some criminal activity in the home country that's not a bar. Occasionally they may have a, some minor criminal activity in the U.S. that's not a bar. But the, you, the focus on the discretionary component is a balancing of positive and negative equities. And um, the case law is that only the most egregious negative discretionary factors are supposed to trump or overcome the need for protection. So obviously if you try to say there are no negative discretionary factors, but if there are some, then you argue that whatever they are are relatively minor in comparison with the need for protection and on balance under the relevant BIA case law, um, the need for protection is not trumped and the asylum should be granted in the exercise of discretion. Credibility, this is huge. Um, it is uh, after a statutory change called the Real ID Act, the burden for corroboration um, in immigration matters has been really, really heightened. And that is the applicant for asylum, the law remains that the person's own testimony, the applicant's testimony alone can be enough to establish eligibility for asylum if it's detailed, credible, and consistent. But the change that the law made is the applicant has to come forward with whatever corroborative, corroborative evidence that they can reasonably be expected to explain. And if they don't have it, they have to explain why they don't have it. They can't just say, you know, oh, well, I don't have any. Now, for children, you can imagine, and especially children in detention, it's very hard to get corroborative evidence from the home country. And imagine, too, depending on what the claim is about, it's hard to get corroborative evidence if your um, mother abused you or if your stepfather was sexually violating you or if uh, gang members were threatening you on the street or whatever some of the other things may be. 
So corroboration of direct personal evidence um, uh, incidents is not impossible, but it's hard. Every once in a while, you will have medical records or a police record, um, or you may be able to contact a family member to develop an affidavit about things that happened. If you're really lucky, perhaps a family member in the United States has already been granted asylum, and you can provide evidence of that. That's good corroborative evidence if it happens. But often, it's really the testimony of a child applicant about their own story, what happened in their own case, and then the corroborative evidence comes from country condition reports, newspaper articles, human rights reports, internet research, shy away from Wikipedia, um, um, scholarly articles, journals, um, there's tons of human rights information uh, readily available now on the internet that's, you know, good, reliable information. Um, so generally available country condition information, including State Department human rights reports and country profiles, are what courts consider to be the gold standard here. The um, Cadillac, if you can afford it, is individualized expert testimony. And I mean if you can afford it by if you can obtain it pro bono um, or if you can afford to pay for it or a child's family member can uh, uh, afford to pay for it. Um, it's not that you need an expert witness in every case, you don't. But you have to really analyze your claim, figure out what's the core of it, what's the hook, what's the thing that's gonna make the asylum officer or if you're back in court, the judge, going to believe this claim? Is it a gang issue that you have to prove? Is it that your client has suffered sexual trauma? Is it that a certain indigenous group in a certain part of the country is very, very um, disfavored? Figure out what that is and try to prove that one most important link, if you can, by some outside testimony. And that's the place where I think um, an academic or a doctor, a, I mean a physician, who can examine your client and say there are scars or a hearing loss or something else that's um, maybe there's a um, injury to the genitalia or something like that but some physical indicia that your client has suffered whatever harm they say they've suffered sometimes there are things that leave no marks at all and then a psychological evaluation from somebody experienced at dealing with trauma is going to be the way you prove that um, and again, sometimes it's country condition information and not so much uh, corroboration that's specific to what's happened to your exact child. But think about whether an expert can help plug whatever the holes are in your case and help spare your client some of the trauma of testifying, you know, blow by blow about some of the things that have happened. But credibility is super, super important, and if you don't deal with it, you will have problems in your case. The immigration judge has to make an actual determination about credibility. This is if you're in front of a judge. This um, outright credibility finding isn't required by the asylum officer, but it's implicit that they have to believe the applicant credible to grant. Um, so uh, I just can't say enough about how important credibility is. And that means don't put in inconsistent statements either. If you start working with witnesses and developing affidavits and they actually contradict your client's story, you have to do one of two things. Go back to your client and reconcile the discrepancy and figure out whether there's something you need to correct or adjust in um, dates or some place or some other circumstance or else decide that it's not worth using the other witness because it calls evidence into question um, that you'd rather not have questioned. So remember, everything you put forward has to be true and reliable, but you don't have to put into evidence every piece of evidence you have or call every witness that exists. It's You, you can't put on anything that's affirmatively false, but you don't have a burden to put in things that are at odds with you know, your theory of the case. So be judicious. Sometimes people's witnesses blow up in their faces and that is never a good thing. Tips on presenting the best case for minors. Obviously, this is no different from adults. Know the statutes, the regulations, and the case law, but particularly look at the case law for children and the guidance on the adjudication of claims for kids before the asylum office in particular. Um, Know the exception to the one-year deadline if your kid is about to turn 18 or just has. 
tell the truth. That goes without saying, obviously, any lawyer in any application or any evidence you're filing, tell the truth is the rule. The reason I put it in here is there's, I think there's a particular compulsion, let's say, that lawyers feel in working with children to help the child. Every once in a while, you come across a child that has some negative factors, okay? Maybe they have crimes, maybe they have gang activity. I've seen it come up the most where there has been, especially in those cases where the claim is based on getting away from gangs, they may have had some bad stuff. Maybe some of it is arguably a bar to asylum. And the lawyers are tempted because they know this thing, this fact, this act, whatever, might defeat the claim. So they'll begin to approach it as sometimes clients do, which is, well, how will they ever know if I, if I say no, right? How will they know? How can they prove it? Well, I'll, what if I just say no? And I, I have to tell you, um, you just can't do that. I mean, it may put you into the rubric of you have a withholding claim and not an asylum claim, but when I say tell the truth, that also means you're helping someone prepare a form under penalties of perjury and you're signing it as a preparer. If there are facts that defeat the claim, you can't help that. Think about making a different claim, think about not pursuing that one, but hear facts that you don't like and just say no on the hope that it's never gonna come up, that's never okay. And that's what tell the truth means. Um, don't believe everything you read. That means um, this happens less with children, but people sometimes bring you altered evidence, things that have been Xeroxed crooked or obvious white out on reports. Don't use information like that. Paper your case, that's the corroboration, and read and know all the materials that you're submitting. Um, plenty of evidence is good. This thing about ICE counsel trying more asylum cases in a year than you will in a lifetime, that pertains to court. It means they really know the law and they know how to zero in on the weaknesses of your case. On the other hand, they have about five minutes for preparation and you have a ton of time. So you can way, way um, uh, impress the judge with preparation and actual evidence rather than argument designed to poke holes. Know the law in your jurisdiction. Oh, never overlook psychological persecution. There is a temptation to focus only on physical acts that have happened badly, but for children in particular, other acts can qualify. Um, read the stuff in the materials that explains about that. Uh, and I think that's it.